of 1 Thessalonians, and uh, we are now at chapter 2. And uh, last Sunday, you may remember that uh, we uh, looked at the profile of a servant leader. And we looked at 11 characteristics of a servant leader. Now, today, uh, verse uh, 13, chapter 2, verse 13, uh, <laughs> Uh, you have to do a complete message on one verse because it's so powerful. So let me read to you 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. And we also, Paul, Silas, Timothy, plural leadership, we also thank God continually because when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. So I want to unpack this verse and I have given it the title, Interact with the Word. Uh, that's a phrase uh, that you have uh, heard me say quite a few times. Uh, don't uh, sit as a spectator when it comes to the word of God. Uh, actively, mentally, emotionally uh, get involved uh, with what the text is saying. Interact with the word of God. So only two main points today. Point A, continuous thanksgiving. You will see that right at the beginning of the verse. We also thank God continually. Now, if you go back to chapter 1 and verse 2, Paul had already thanked God for the Thessalonian church. He had received a wonderful good report that uh, the Thessalonian church was strong, vibrant, growing, active. They were evangelizing. And uh, Paul thanks uh, God and the church for their faith and love, chapter 1. But now in chapter 2 and verse 13... <laughs> He is going to thank God for the way they responded to the word of God. The way they responded to the word of God. And for any pastor, uh, that is a big reason to give thanks to God for. Because we prepare the word, we diligently share it. And then when uh, the people who hear it uh, begin to act on it, uh, that brings great joy to any servant of God but also it is an occasion to give thanks uh, to God. Now, in the matter of thanksgiving, I want to use two S words, as you can see on the screen. Uh, you need to be specific, don't generalize. Don't generalize and say, thank you, Lord, amen. You need to be specific. And the second S word is you need to be spontaneous. Spontaneous means you don't have a fixed time for thanksgiving although there is nothing wrong with having a fixed time for thanksgiving. But right through the day, you are able to give thanks to God as uh, things turn out. So last night, uh, I had a house prayer meeting. I was driving back home, and suddenly I saw in a gas station, the gas price was eight cents less than normal. So I said, thank you, Lord. I pulled in. I filled my gas tank, right? And then all the lights were green, to my uh, way home, I said, Lord, this is unbelievable. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. That was just last night. Now, uh, don't expect the same things to happen to you. You may have to fill up gas for a much higher price, right? And all the lights will be red for you. But for me, <laughs> last night, I had ample reason to be specific and to be spontaneous. Specific and spontaneous. Right? So continuous thanksgiving. That will eliminate grumbling and complaining and uh, becoming negative uh, when you and I develop the attitude of gratitude. Now we come to point B. And point B is a commitment to truth. Be committed to truth. So this word truth is actually the word of God. And in verse 13, two times, you may want to underline it, two times Paul uses the expression, the word of God. You receive the word of God, 
And then he says, but as it actually is the word of God, anything that gets repeated, you should be able to underline it, right? That gives you a good clue as to what that passage is trying to teach you. So when we say truth, we are referring uh, to the totality of scripture. We are referring to the word of God, the Bible, ultimate truth. Now, we are going to see how the Thessalonian church responded to truth. And I want to break that down into several uh, points. Uh, the first thing is they were attentive to the truth. They were attentive to the truth. Look at the first line. When you received the word of God, you might want to circle that word receive. That word receive simply means the hearing of the ear. So before Paul came to town, as it were, they cleaned their ears of all the wax, which you and I, I hope we do every time we have a shower. We clean the ear of all the wax. Why? So that the ear is clean <laughs> and that we are in a good position to hear what the speaker is going to say. So this morning, as you prepare to come to the house of God, I hope that uh, you and I uh, made uh, adequate preparation to be attentive to what God is going to say. And that begins with the hearing of the ear. Now, under this, I want to uh, uh, mention a few things. The first thing is, the first bullet there, the miracle of the word of God. The miracle of the word of God. As I have already said two times, Paul uses the expression, the word of God. What were the Thessalonians going to hear? They were going to hear the word of God. Now, later on in chapter 4, and in verse 15, Paul says, according to the Lord's own word. Now, chapter 4 has got to be one of the most critically important passages in the Bible because it talks about the afterlife. It talks about resurrection. And uh, Paul says, the revelation concerning resurrection, I have received it directly from the Lord. And so he uses this expression according to the Lord's own word. This is not something that I invented. This is not something that I dreamt about after eating too many pizzas. This is something that was given to me directly by the Lord. The Bible evidences itself to be God's word by the heavenliness of its doctrine, the unity of its parts, and its power to convert sinners and to edify saints. <laughs> that one uh, statement speaks a mouthful. Why should you be interested in the Bible? Why are we spending about 40 minutes every Sunday uh, studying the Bible? The, 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 the reason, heavenliness of doctrine that you find inside the Bible, the unity of its parts, the ability to convert a sinner and the ability to edify the believers. This morning in my personal prayer, I prayed for that, uh, for us and for all the churches, that we would be edified, we would be strengthened, we would be challenged, we would be motivated after hearing the word of God. You know, the last thing I want to see is at the end of a service, a person like a dead duck, right? You, sh you and I should come alive because we have heard the word of God. By the way, that's the first song that we sang today, coming alive, right? Now, here's another very important statement. The way a Christian treats his Bible shows how he regards the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Very, very important. The way you treat the Bible is the way you treat the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. The two are inseparable. You can't separate the word of God from the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the Lord Jesus is the living word. John chapter 1, verses 1 and 14. He is the living word. And the Bible is the written word. So every time we teach the Bible, we are trusting the Holy Spirit to make the Lord Jesus Christ the living word real to a person. No preacher can do that. 
That's the work of the Holy Spirit. We do our best in explaining, but only the Holy Spirit can illumine the glory, the grace, and the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ to a person's heart. Now, there are three ways in which the living word and the written word are comparable. Uh, they are a unity in three ways. Uh, the, the, the Bible is uh, called, uh, they are both bread. <laughs> the Bible is bread. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Right? Matthew 4.4. 4. And in John 6.35 and 38, the Lord Jesus Christ claimed to be the bread of life. So both the Bible and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ are referred to as bread. So why do we have bread? For nourishment. For nourishment. That's the staple food uh, of that day and even today. Yesterday I went to Shoppers Drug Mart and I bought two loaves of bread. They were giving it for $1.99 only, only on Saturday. Today it's $2.99, John, sorry. Right? But uh, so why did I buy two loaves of bread? Because that provides nourishment for the body. You put butter jam or you put butter and tuna or you eat it with cut sambal, mouth, mouth watering, right? And then you have a little uh, banana that goes along with that and a hot cup of tea. Deal done. Deal done, right? So the, the word of God is light. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalm 119, verse 105. And guess what? John 8, 12. The Lord Jesus Christ claimed to be the light of the world. So both the Bible and the Lord Jesus are light. And then John 14, 6, the Lord Jesus claimed to be truth. I am the truth. John 17, 17, the Bible is truth. Sanctify them by the truth. The Lord Jesus prayed, your word is truth. So at least in three different ways, the living word and the written word are one. Bread, light, and truth. So the miracle of God's word. This book that you hold in your hand is a miracle. The, the second bullet, the messengers of God's word. So Paul says, you receive the word of God, which you heard from us. So there have got to be proclaimers. There have got to be those who speak out the word of God, fellows like me, and not limited to me. Every one of you is a messenger of God's word. When you take one verse from the Bible and you share it with someone, you become a messenger of God's word. So we read today from Romans chapter 10. And verse 14 says, how can they hear without someone preaching to them? The Bible is kind of a closed book unless someone comes, opens it up, and explains it to us. Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch. He's on his way from Jerusalem back to Ethiopia. He's reading the Bible, but he can't understand. And then Philip comes alongside, explains the text, and you have the first uh, uh, Ethiopian convert. And the gospel goes to Ethiopia through that uh, eunuch. And uh, it's because you opened the Bible and someone came alongside and explained it, right? So please don't allow your Bible to be a closed book in your house. Don't let it gather dust. Pick it up, open it, read it. I prayed with someone this morning who was celebrating his birthday and uh, he was very excited about watching a T20 cricket match. I said, look, your first importance is the word of God. So I, I prayed over him, but in the prayer, I quoted several scriptures. And he said in the evening, he'll join us for our Tamil study. So uh, the messengers, Acts 13, 44. Don't you love this verse? Acts 13, 44. The whole city gathered to hear the word of God. Paul and Barnabas being the preachers. And uh, one Saturday when they preached, there was a limited number. And next Saturday, the whole place was filled with people. Word of mouth. Word of mouth, by the way, is the best advertisement. 
WhatsApp has its good use, emails have its good use, but hey, you picking up that phone and talking to someone and saying, how about joining us on Sunday morning at uh, 11.30? Did, did you do that this past week? Did you pick up the phone and call somebody, encourage them, motivate them, right? If you didn't, then you fail, right? So uh, the whole city gathered to hear the word of God. Be a messenger. Be a mouthpiece for God. Be a mouthpiece for God, right? Just, just quote a verse and let the Holy Spirit do his work in the heart of the person. Now, the third bullet I want to highlight, the manner of receiving God's word. I've already mentioned this to you. Outward, external listening. Now, the Thessalonians didn't have a Bible in their hands when Paul came to town. So they couldn't check they couldn't underline, they couldn't circle, they couldn't mark. They, just, they were just giving Paul undivided attention. How do we receive the word of God? Through the ear gate. Through the ear gate. That's how the word of God gets into us, through the ear gate. Now, I want to give you three very practical suggestions as to how you can hear the word of God, right? Daily hear God's word. It must be something that you and I do daily. We call it the quiet time. I mean, whatever term you like to use, that's fine. Every single day, you and I must be committed to setting aside a fixed time so that we are able to hear God's word through the ear gate. This morning I was reading Isaiah chapter 30, and in Isaiah ch chapter 30, there's a remarkable verse that says, you're going to hear a voice behind your ear saying, this is the way, walk in it. What a verse. What a verse on guidance. So you young people, you have many big decisions to make in your life. It has got to be founded on the word of God. You've got to hear some word in your ear, ringing in your ear from the scriptures, guiding you into making those decisions. So it must be daily. So very often I ask people, how, how about your Bible reading? Oh, I did it once today. Or somebody might say, I did it twice today. So then I ask them, uh, how often do you, did you eat this week? Oh, three times a day plus two snacks in between, five. And for the Bible, you were struggling to read it just once? Something wrong. So why do you eat physically? Because of physical appetite. At 12 noon, some, something inside your stomach begins to growl. Then you go and eat some food, right? And then even when it doesn't growl, you put something in, right? And that's what brings obesity, right? Overeating. <laughs> but when it comes to the spiritual, there's no physical appetite. Right? So please, please, daily reading of the scriptures. The second thing I want to highlight is to diligently hear God's word. So what do I mean by the word diligent? It means, for example, if you come on Sunday morning, you bring your Bible with you. You have a pen so that you can uh, take down notes. I will never ask you to do something which I'm not doing. You have a pen, make sure it's a writing pen because sometimes pen gets stuck. Writing pen, these are pen from Bangladesh. A missionary gave it to me and I'm prepared to sell it for $10 today. <laughs> these pens are very rare, John. You won't find it anywhere. See how it is shaking, right? And uh, you bring a pen, then you have a piece of paper to take down some notes, right? You just can't receive God's word by sitting like this. You know what will happen then? What we want to see happen is, right? And before you go home, you, you, won't, you won't remember a single thing of what you heard today. Right? That's why we put PowerPoints and uh, we keep it on so that you can write something 
my whole, if you look at my, I'm not showing this to boast or anything, but all papers, all notes. Sometimes I'm listening to a sermon on the radio on, while I'm driving. When I come to a red light, I quickly pull out and write the notes, right? I don't want to miss it, right? Then I have filing cards on which I write key, key words, right? I'm giving diligence. I'm giving diligence, right? Uh, you need to have a notebook, you need to have a pen, you need to write something down so that you can process it. When you go home, you've got to process it. And as a family, sit together and say, hey, let's talk about what we heard today. Let's discuss it. So daily, diligently, and be disciplined when it comes to hearing God's word. Remove all the distractions. You will hear God's voice best in silence. In silence. There must be mental preparation. There must be spiritual preparation. Right? So that you are ready to receive through the ear gate and into the heart gate what God is trying to say to you and to me. So, be attentive to truth. Now, the second thing we notice from uh, verse 13 is acknowledge and affirm the truth. Acknowledge and affirm the truth. Now, watch this carefully. You accepted it not as a human word. Remarkable, isn't it? Here were the Thessalonians. First time they are hearing three preachers come to town and they are talking about the truth, the Bible, and they affirm it and they acknowledge it to be the word of God. They didn't look at it as a, another human message, another philosophy, or another teaching, or another religious group cult. No. They affirmed it and acknowledged it to be the word of God. Now, Jeremiah, my favorite Old Testament uh, prophet, very tough ministry, 40 years of preaching, zero converts. Uh, and uh, he, he has something remarkable to say in, in his book. And here is one verse, Jeremiah 9.20. He's looking at the people. They are stiff-necked rebels, obstinate, stubborn as you can find a person to be. <laughs> that's, the, that's his congregation. And look, look at Jeremiah 9.20. Hear the word of the Lord. Open your ears to the words of his mouth. Two times Jeremiah says, what you are going to hear coming from my lips is not the words of a prophet, but it is the living word of God. So you better hear with both your ears, hear with both your ears. Uh, one famous preacher uh, would use the expression, listen up. <laughs> I like that. From time to time, he would look at the congregation and say, listen up. He would look particularly at a person who's falling asleep and say, listen up. Right? So that's what Jeremiah is saying. Listen up. Wake up. Open both your ears. Give God your undivided attention. Right? So, and affirm the Bible to be the word of God. Now, how do you come to that position of affirming the Bible to be the word of God? Two answers. One is divine revelation. Divine revelation means God himself has to reveal that truth to you. Right? Again, let me say no preacher can do that. We can give all the evidences as to why we believe the Bible to be the word of God, external and internal evidences. But ultimately, when it's all said and done, the Holy Spirit is the one who is able to show us that the Bible is indeed the living word of God, divine revelation. And the second bullet there is divine recognition. This is where the Holy Spirit gives us inward assurance. Inward assurance 
it's true, it's true, it's true. The Bible is true. The Bible is the word of God. But you're going to hear another voice. The other voice is the devil coming and casting doubts in your mind. Injecting doubts in your mind. Okay? And that, that's a ding-dong battle. <laughs> Holy Spirit telling you it's true. The devil coming along and saying, you know, how can you believe all this? So recently, uh, someone sent me a video on Noah's Ark. And my goodness. It, it was uh, like a 12 minute video and uh, I think I sent it to Ravi and we had a little discussion on it and in that this guy is brilliantly eloquent the guy who did it <laughs> and he's trying to disprove that Noah Sark really existed <clears throat> and bottom line he's saying he had a stack of wood piled up on top of each other and he said if you disprove Noah Sark bang the whole thing comes crashing down So that's how the devil works. He will raise people who are very eloquent, brilliant, and they would try to inject doubts into your mind. Young people, when you go to university, my goodness, there'll be all kinds of crazy things happening. Most of our church grown young people lose their faith in university. You know why? They come under the influence of ungodly friends and ungodly professors who inject a lot of doubt into their minds and boom, faith goes. So you and I come to realize that the Bible is the word of God by divine revelation and divine recognition where the Holy Spirit inwardly witnesses to you and to me and gives assurance that the Bible is indeed the word of God. Now, watch a very, uh, very intriguing statement that you will hear from some pulpits. And in some pulpits, a preacher might get up and say, the Bible contains the word of God. Now, what do we say? The Bible is the word of God. Very subtle, very subtle. The Bible contains the word of God, meaning there are passages in the Bible that you can describe as myth. They are not from God. Uh, the miraculous is all eliminated in that whole process. And then you're left with nothing. Just a very subtle difference. And if you don't pick it up, you will go that direction, right? We want to affirm this morning, the Bible is the word of God. We are not saying the Bible contains the word of God. Okay? So that's number two. Number three, accept and appropriate the truth accept and appropriate the truth. So now we come to another word that Paul uses in verse 13. You accepted it. The first word was receive, hearing of the ear. The second word is a totally different word, accept. It's the hearing of the heart. Hearing of the heart. Actually, uh, the, 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 the literal Greek word is welcome the word of God. Welcome the word of God into your heart, right? Uh, we, we, in many houses, they have what is called a welcome mat. Right, right at the front door, they put a welcome mat. Everyone is welcome into this house except CRA. <laughs> Some houses also have, everyone is welcome into this house except preachers. Right? So when I see a mat like that, I quickly take it and dump it into the garbage. Right? Of course, now people have cameras, so big problem, right? So, welcome the word of God into your heart. Keep your heart door wide open and give the word of God a red carpet welcome. A red carpet welcome. Now, practically, how does this work out in your life and my life today? How do you give the word of God a red carpet welcome? Are you ready for the two M words? Memorize God's word. Don't just hear it, but take time to memorize the word of God. So Psalm 119 verse 11, the psalmist said, I have stored up your word in my heart and he gives the reason so that I might not sin 
against you. Now, young people, listen carefully, right? Not only young people, all of us. You are going to be tempted, tempted to sin. How do you overcome temptation? By using the divine detergent called the word of God. The word of God is a powerful restrainer of sin. Are you wondering why you give in to sin so easily? You know why? Because you have not taken time to store the word of God in your heart through memorization. You know, just do a little math. If you memorize just one verse per week, just one verse per week, that's four verses a month, 12 into 4, 48. And if you want to round it up, by the end of the year, you would have memorized 50 verses. So how are you doing 2021? Of the 50, how many do you know by memory? Now, don't tell me, oh, I know John 11.35, Jesus wept. Right? Okay, that's one gone. How many? 49 more. Peter slept. Okay, take one more. 48. So, young people, in order to be victorious <laughs> in the battle of life, right, we have to memorize God's word. 1 John 2.14. The word of God abides in you. You know the meaning of the word abide? It has made its home in your life. You know, sometimes when somebody comes to visit you, you, you say the statement, right? I mean, just treat this like your own home. What are you saying? Go to any room. You can open anything. You can open the fridge, put anything into your mouth. That's the attitude we should have to the Bible. Let it be at home in your life, every aspect of your life. Okay? And you have overcome the evil one. How do you defeat Satan on a daily basis? By memorizing the scriptures. Now, in order to memorize scripture, the second M comes into play. And the second M is meditate on God's word. M and M. <laughs> M and M. Memorize. And meditate. Psalm 1 2, you know the verse well. Talking about the blessed man whose life is going to be wonderfully fruitful and productive and fresh, right? On his law, he meditates day and night. I get terribly convicted by this verse. You know why? That little clause, day and night. Does any one of us meditate on the Bible day and night? No. I mean, we've got the Raptors game to watch. We've got to watch the Leaves game. We had to watch the T20. Oh, that movie has come. I've got to watch that movie. So where is the time for us to meditate on God's word day and night? So, again, let me be intensely practical with you. I hope, please, all of you will access these notes. And please, please, please use it in your life. Right? I'm preaching my heart out here. And I'm hoping that you would take this and apply it to your life, please. So here are four R words I want to give you as to how you can meditate on God's word. Read repeatedly. I don't read a whole chapter a day. I don't. There was a time I used to, I don't. Now I only read about five verses. Today I read only five verses from Isaiah chapter 30. I read it. I reread it. Right? I reread it. Repetitious reading of the same five verses or seven verses or ten verses, whatever you may choose to read. The second R is read reflectively. Think about what you're reading. Don't let your mind be a blank. Think about what you're reading. Some alternate words might come into your mind. Write it down. Write it down. Right? So, read reflectively. The third R is read and relate. Relate means where else in the Bible do I find a similar verse? Relating other portions of scripture to the passage that you are reading. And the Holy Spirit will help you. Okay, read and relate. 
Now, the fourth one is not on your notes. So, uh, Andrew, you may have to include this later. Uh, the fourth one is read and record. Write something down. Write something down. I don't know about you, but for me, if I write something down, it gets impregnated into my mind. Simple. If you write something down, it will get impregnated into your mind. That's how you meditate. There's no magic in this. But of course, it involves a lot of discipline. Lot of discipline. Let me go through those four R words again. Read repetitiously. Read reflectively. Read and relate. Read and record. If I come to your house, you should be able to show me books where you have practiced this. Then I know you're growing. Otherwise, you're kidding yourself. Otherwise, you're kidding yourself. Okay? Meditation is cherishing the gold and savoring the honey. Somebody very kindly gave me a bottle of honey, uh, fresh honey uh, from, from a farm. And I use it very, very, very uh, carefully. Uh, the, you can use the word stingy. So if you come to my house, Sam, sorry, I won't put the, sam, uh, put the honey into the tea. I'll put white sugar for you, right? So sometimes I just take a little. Oh. Oh. Savoring, savoring. Now I haven't got gold. So if one of you can part with some of your gold, I want to. Cherish the gold. Hey, gold. Wow. And that's what meditation is. It is cherishing the gold and savoring the honey. Now, I'm, I've given you a little prayer. I want all of you to pray this prayer. Okay? What is the prayer? Ask the Lord to waken the spiritual taste buds of your soul. Your tongue has got a lot of taste buds. That's why we enjoy food. And there are taste buds in your soul. And you've got to ask the Holy Spirit to awaken those taste buds of the soul. So before you start reading the Bible, will you pray that prayer? Lord, awaken the taste buds of my soul. And watch what is going to happen. If nothing happens, please come and tell me. Okay? But try it. So, accept and appropriate. Now, 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 number four, apply the truth. <laughs> apply means obey. Do it. So, we are told that the Thessalonian believers, they heard with the ear gate, they welcomed the word into the heart, and they chose to believe. The word believe means you act on what you hear. You act on what you hear obedience. So Psalm 19 and verse 11. Moreover, by them, that's the word of God, your servant is warned, in keeping of them, there is great reward. When you obey the word of God implicitly, there is going to be wonderful rewards. I think uh, the younger generation uses the word perks. You all use the word perks, right? What are the perks? There are wonderful dividends of obedience. There are terrible consequences to disobedience. Right? So apply the truth. In, in light of what I'm hearing today, my personal reading, what should I be doing? What should I be doing? So that's number four. Right? Now num number five. Number five is activated by the truth. Activated by the truth. Again, look at the wording which is indeed at work in you who believe. If you read other translations, they insert the word effectively. King James Version uses the word effectually. The word of God is effectually at work in those who choose to believe, act upon it. Be activated by the word. In other words, don't let the word of God be dormant in your life. 
Dormant means nothing is happening. It has gone to sleep. Right? The word of God must be active. Now let me spell out three areas where the word of God is active. There are many more areas, but let me just highlight three. First is the word of God is active to convict us of sin. Not just for salvation only, but on a day-by-day -day basis. Conviction of sin. I have blown it today. Oh, I shouldn't have spoken like that today. Oh, today I was so lustful. Oh, today I chose to lie. Oh, my goodness. The Holy Spirit of God convicts us. That's the word of God active in your life and my life. And then, not only uh, are we convicted of sin, but we are converted by the scriptures, right? No person is converted apart from the scriptures. The Holy Spirit uses Bible verses to bring us to our senses and to our knees. Can I repeat that? The Holy Spirit uses Bible verses to bring us to our senses and to drive us to our knees. That's why we so passionately preach the Bible. Right? That is why we quote so many scripture verses. Why? Because we want people to get converted, to be turned around. Converted means to be turned around. I'm going the wrong direction and the word of God turns me around and I'm now on God's highway to heaven. Uh, are you on God's highway to heaven? That's another nice way of describing conversion. God's highway to heaven. And then when the word of God is active, effectively at work in my life, there are going to be changes in my life. Changes in my value system. Changes in the goals that I have in my life. Changes in my priorities. Changes in my priorities. So in what ways has the word of God changed your life? Changed my life, right? Uh, the word of God gives us a deeper, greater longing for heaven, for eternity, right? A 46-year-old film star, very popular film star in India died at age 46. He died after exercising. So hence, the conclusion, don't exercise. 46 years old. That's how life is. Uh, by the way, I heard also that Rajini Kant is in hospital. Uh, in the Tamil cinema, he's called superstar. Right? So life is so very brief and short. And the Holy Spirit uh, awakens us to the reality of eternity, to heaven. Those are the changes that come into our life. Right? Now, finally, uh, point, uh, this is point number six. Communicate the truth. Communicate the truth. Actually, uh, it uh, should uh, come as part of the activated by the truth. Communicate the truth. Communicate means share it. So yesterday, family day, the theme was witnessing. I went through the order of the events. I was very happy that the topic chosen was witnessing. But my question is, we are hearing challenges on evangelism, witnessing, but are we doing it? Are we doing it? That's the question, the acid test. So look at this verse. We have to communicate at two levels, okay? Now, if this final verse that shows up on the screen doesn't wake you up and cause you to shiver, shake, and shudder, uh, nothing else will. Hebrews 3, 12 and 13. Now, watch this verse very carefully. But exhort one another every Christmas. You are not listening. Let's try that one more time. Exhort one another on New Year's Day. Is that what it says? Come on, I need a feedback. What does it say? 
Can you say it again, please, loud? Are we doing it? Every day, are you picking up the phone and saying, how did your day go today? Did you live for the Lord? We don't. We don't. Exhort one another every day. <laughs> and just in case you missed it, look at what it says after that. As long as it is called today, this 24 hour period, October 31st, Sunday, 24 hour period, exhort one another. Why? The reason is given that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is charming, sin is deceitful, sin is deadly. And none of us are immune to it. As old as I am, I am not immune from sin. I fight the battles with sin just like you every single day. And it is only through exhortation on a daily basis are we able to kill sin in our life. Now, the only time we pick up the phone is we call and say, uh, what did you eat today? What did your mom cook? Are there any leftovers? Can I come and share? Hey, man, there's a nice movie going. Can you see how far we are from the Bible? Hebrews 3.13 communicate the truth. Let's make a start today. God is going to bless us with a new month, November. In light of the message, say to yourself, it's going to be different in November. I'm going to take this message very, very, very seriously. I'm going to apply it to my life. I want to see changes. I want to be a servant leader. And then if we have a testimony time end of November, you all should be able to say the profound impact and changes of the Bible because you chose to interact with the word. And so, Lord, we thank you for the power of the word. We thank you that your word is true, that your word is living, and that your word will accomplish the purposes for which it has been released. Take this word, Lord, spoken from faltering lips, and uh, Lord, seal it to every heart and may it result in action for your glory. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.